I want to talk about the golden circle. So let's go to our scripture. Andrew, can you go to our scripture, please? I've got two passages today for you. The first is uh, from the book of 2 John, uh, verse 6. Um, I, I, I won't ask you to stand, but you, you may read it with me. This is love that you walk in his commandments. This is his commandments that you walk in love as you have heard from the beginning. I want to just pause it. He's saying that the very first thing that we heard about when we came to Christ was that we should walk in love. And that if we love him, we'll walk in his commandments and that to follow his commandments is to walk in love. That there is a cyclical motion to this instruction. Um, 2 John is written by the Apostle John. And he, he was known for the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the disciple of love. And so he is now exhorting us and saying, I want you to remember love. The second passage, if you would, Andrew, is from Matthew. It's a famous one. You, you might know it. The righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you on thirsty and give you drink? Sorry, I've skipped on. I'm reading the wrong bit. Sorry, I'm reading it from the screen. That's why. All right, let's start again. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. It says in another translate later on, I think it says, when you did it not to the least of these, you did it not to me. Father, I want to pray over this word today. And I ask, as, as, I, as has been my prayer for a long time now, that you will bind us together in love. Paul writes to Timothy and says, the end of the commandment is love. And I pray that all things that we discuss and look to would lead us towards love. I pray honestly that you would bind us together as a family with cords of love that cannot be broken. We know that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken and we pray that you would not be the third but the first strand that we are all united around. And we pray that every relationship, every person that relates to another individual, every, two, every, every relationship of two, which, is this, which every church is built on, that you would be the primary thread that would twine those people and hold those people together. Father, I pray for this word, that you would indeed impart a spiritual gift. And I pray that it would change us. I pray that everyone who is not walking in love, I pray for myself included, that we would draw a line in the sand today and that we would ever from this moment walk in love. Not according to my words, but according to the word. I pray, Father, that everything that I would say that would not be of you, that you would hide it behind the veil. And I pray that you would... Take my mouth as an empty vessel and use it to speak your encouragement to us at this time. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. When I was, uh, let's see, 19, 10 years ago, I went to the gym. Yeah, I knew it was going to be met with that response. <laughs> Predictable. Just once. No. I, I, I went for a period of six weeks over the summer. So it was actually about 10 years ago. And uh, while I was at the gym, um, I, I was doing the rowing machine. You know, the rowing machine. I don't particularly like the rowing machine, but I was doing the rowing machine. And while I was doing the rowing machine, I was stretching back and forth. And the, the guy, the personal trainer came along, and I think he was looking for, you know, to obviously recruit me into one of his clans. So he began to give me some little bit of free advice. And he began to show me how I was doing the rowing machine. Wrong, and he said to me that, you know, it's important that when you're doing the rowing machine, that you don't try to do it harder if you're doing it wrong. But if you're doing it wrong, you've got to go back to the beginning and do it right. And then from that point onwards, everything else will be good. Otherwise, your effort is wasted if the foundations are incorrect. And I love that because it echoes what I like as my wife calls me a purist. Um, that that I, I love things to be right. Uh, I love the word of God and I love things to be right. And if things aren't by the word, I think, why bother? Uh, things are going to be stuffed up and wrong. And that's good. But there is a time when it gets a little bit too much. And John is exhorting us in, in his second epistle that the commandment will lead us to love. 
He's saying that if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. But to obey my commandments is to love. That one leads to the other. And that if you have only got part of that puzzle, you're missing something. I want to say that the golden circle, love, is a full circle. And I've been living a life of having a half circle, I think. Maybe you have too, where I, 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 loved, I loved the commandment, but I didn't love what the commandment was meant to be pointing me to. Many people, the most important thing to them is love. And they will stand on this side of the stage. And everything's about love. If you're not preaching about love, what, then why are you preaching? It's, they, they love words like justice, mercy, grace. They love worshipping. The, the word is important, but love is, is the principal thing. And this isn't wrong. This is, this is good, but they love love. I want mercy. I, I want, I, I like messages like the Father heart of God. I like, I like listening to Joseph Prince and grace. I like God's love. And that governs me, and it's good. And you've got some people over here, called Scott, who like words like truth <laughs> and, and righteousness. They, these guys like to worship. These guys like to pray. <laughs> these guys like to read, you know, plenty of books. These guys think you're not reading the word, you're backslidden. And, and, and these guys over here like, like the commandment. They like the word. They like to fast. They, they like to press into the things of God. They like, they like preachers like, you know, Mark Driscoll or, um, you know, people who lived 100 years ago like Andrew Murray and, you know, maybe, maybe a bit of T.D. Jakes when he's really stirred up. They're there over here. And, and, you know, neither of these is wrong unless you only have this. Because if I only have... If I only have the word, but I don't have love, then I forget the whole point of what love was for. The word is pointing me to, the word is points me towards love. But if I'm over here and all I have is love, then I become such a freewheeler that I forget that my love is actually meant to teach me to obey Christ's commandments. He says, but he says, he says if you love me, obey my commandments. But it's love, it's love and obedience. And obedience and love, they're the same thing. It, it, it would be hypocritical of me, highly, if I said I love my wife and yet I never did anything that she asked me to and I didn't seek to please her and be caring to her. But if all I did was to seek to be friend nice to her and I was like an autonotron robot that did the washing up and, you know, did everything but then didn't actually love her and pour out my love and romance her, then I would be a pretty bad husband too. I, I want both. We want this from our parents. We want the love, but we also want them to direct us. If you've got too much love and not enough truth, then, then, then you will not guide and direct and discipline. But if all you do is discipline and don't have love, then I'm going to fear you. I'm not going to love you. I'm not going to listen to you. So you get the point. It's meant we're meant to be a complete circle. And if I may say, I believe that me, but not only me, I think many of us at the river have been more in this camp than in the other camp. Because when you look at the word, You've got such a picture, and it's a strong picture, and it's good. When we look at our nation, many people don't value the word. But just because we value the word doesn't mean that we devalue everything else. It means that we value everything. We value everything altogether. And so I, I, I would like to perhaps venture to say that we, of the river, we as the river have been perhaps out of balance. We, we, we have stuck to the commandment, but we've not stuck to where the commandment leads us to. This has been me through and through, and I'll tell you, just I'll give you some of my, uh, a glimpse into my, into my life. When we get too much into the word, and we have not love, lo love is the reason. Love is the direction. The word points us towards love, and let us remember that love is a person, <laughs> and his name is God. That the word points us to love. But when, when I'm in the word, but I, I'm not moving towards love, then it becomes a rod. When I was at Bible school 10 years ago, I was at RBI. That was our old Bible school, the River Bible Institute. And I remember someone coming to me and saying, you know, God, Scott, is it, is, is, you know, is it the word or is it love? And I was like, it's the word, it's the word, it's the word. And then one day I began to read about the fact that, you know, the letter, the law, the letter of the law kills. And I got so deflated, I thought, oh dear. <laughs> You're taking away my golden calf, what am I going to do? The word directs us towards love. And when we have just the word, but we're not directed, all we do is we go round in circles in the word. And we begin to take scriptures and we begin to skew them and tweak them and they begin to go out of direction because we're not moving to, the word, to where the word should point us to go. Word with direction is great, but if the word has no direction, it's just the word I begin to get lost. That's why we have so many varying doctrines in the body of Christ. 
because they got so consumed in the word going round and round in a circle, round and round over scriptures that they're important, but, but they're, they're not life or death. Listen, if someone's coming to church, they don't, they don't even know what Calvinism and Arminianism mean. They don't care about predestination. They care about me. And yet we're there going, is it, which one is it? Which one is it? If you're a Calvinist, are you single destination or double destination? All the while, we're meant to be moving towards love. But we're, we're stuck in these doctrines and it's dangerous when you get so into the word and you become introspective. You're looking at your navel all the time. And as you begin to look into the word, you begin to look into the commandment. What I did was I began to value production and excellence and quality and you know, all the purest stuff that I like, but, I, but I, I forgot the fact the scriptures say things, you know, like what Hannah said, this is all meant to point you towards love. Do you love people? The lights are great, but they're about love. If the lights are for the lights, then what's the point? <laughs> you know? But I became so obsessed about the lights. If the lights were wrong, I got angry, baby. And, yet, and, and then God began to minister to me, and I, I found a wonderful scripture in James chapter 1, verse 24. It says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Wow. Oh, every time that I was angry, you justify the word. Every time that we are angry, but we think the word justifies our anger, it's because I'm passionate that I'm angry. It does not produce the righteousness of God. Jesus was meek. He said, learn of me, I'm gentle, tender in heart. If, if, if I had to read what I was reading this morning, I found myself in, the, in a familiar book, The Pages of Humility by Andrew Murray, searching my heart and saying, God, how can I preach on love if, if I feel I'm devoid? I'm, I'm desperately looking to, if we have not love, the Bible teaches us, then we have nothing. Love is not only a full circle, it is an uh, all-encompassing circle. Sorry, Rob, I looked at my notes. Damn it. I'm not as good as him. I don't know how he does it. I've been freaking out all week. Got to get it memorized. Got to get it memorized. Love is, love is an all-encompassing circle. Jesus, when he was in the final week of his life, the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes come to him and they test him as they'd been continually testing him in the life of his ministry. And they say to him, what is the most important commandment, teacher? And he says, the most important commandment is love the Lord your God. And the second is like it, love your neighbor. On this hangs the law and the prophets. And from that moment, no one questioned him. Now, I don't quite know why that is, but from that moment, no one questioned him. In other words, it was pretty powerful when he said it. If love is an all-encompassing circle, I would like to suggest to you that Jesus is saying, Loving, love God, love people, everything else hangs on this. In fact, maybe I could go as far as to say loving God means loving people and everything else hangs on this. That everything else that would be important to us is, is secondary to the question of love. And that's tough to chew on. When I go through my day and I wonder, have I taken time to love? It's tough to chew on when love it can be difficult when you begin to say, I want to be all-encompassing in my love. We as Christians, Rob said in starting, and it's true, Jesus says, by this one man, know you're my disciples, by your love for one another. The distinguishing factor of us is meant to be love. It was, not a, it was not a quality known to the Roman world, love. You know, when, when, when you watch people kill each other for sport, love is a little bit lacking. And, and so their love for one another was completely countercultural. Now, of course, now love is, we think that we love, but love still today is as, is as countercultural as ever. Think about it. You can sleep with someone but not love them. Yeah. Oh, now I love you. I've been with you for 10 years and I've, slept, and I've slept with you and everything, but now, now I love you. I mean, how we've degraded the word love. This is the way we use love. This is the way that someone uses love. I love Upsy Daisy. I love you, Daddy. So wait, you love me like you love a fictional character. It probably loves the fictional character more, that's right, yeah. Sometimes Faye and I actually play with her. We go, Summer, who do you love more? Upsy Daisy or Daddy? The trick is you say the one that you wanted to say at last. So I often go, do you love Mummy or Daddy? <laughs> Daddy? But then every now and then you say, I say, do you love Mamma or Daddy? And she goes, Mamma. So I'm, uh, yes, it almost works. 
Love, was, love is still countercultural as ever. We come, we come out of a movie. Oh, I love that one movie. We, we get something new. Oh, I love it. Can't wait. I love it. And I love you, Jesus. I love you like I love all these ethereal material possessions that I don't care about. That, I, that really are throwawayable. So replaceable. Oh, I just love it. I just love it. I love this. Oh, I just, I just love football. I love it. I love it. It's just so good. I love it. I feel great. And it's good. And, we go, and I love you, Jesus. Maybe put my hand out my pocket. Yeah. The, the love is so countercultural. But the biggest way that we as the church should embody love is the fact that our love is all embracing. And I find that is perhaps the most countercultural way that we can talk about love. And I, I, want, I want to tell you that I, I don't possess that love. I, I want to be honest with you. Some years ago, we started Soup on a Run. Uh, great people. They know about all embracing love. We started welcoming, this is, a, I, don't know, I don't know how, this is 10, 8 years ago. We started welcoming homeless people on Sundays. We'd cook them a lunch after the service, and they'd all sit over here, or sometimes at the back, which was lovingly called Drunk's Corner, actually. And people would sneak in at the back. And, and um, it was great because, you know, we actually really were beginning to actually do the work of, work of the ministry. It was good. Praise God for it. But few people sat over there because there was an uncomfortable odor. And during that time, I really took pride in actually sitting with them, getting to know them. I still know many of their names, and I say hi to them, and I, and I love on them, and that's good. But then the hypocrisy came when someone else, someone started coming recently, and oh my word, they stank. And I was saying, you've got to sit them somewhere where the visitors can't smell them. I said that. That's not all embracing love, is it? We as Christians don't have all embracing love because we so ardently hate homosexuals. I'm not saying that we necessarily hate them, but Christians on the whole, if they don't hate them by their words, they certainly hate them by the fact that they just freak out. <laughs> you know, they, they really freak out. You, 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 know, you, know, you know someone around here is, you know, might be gay because they're just like, just acting weird. You're like, Are you okay? It's fine. I just, just saw two men holding hands. <laughs> just disgusting. And you know what? Yeah, God doesn't approve of it. We don't approve of it. doesn't mean that we don't, we don't accept them and love them. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't throw our arms around them and love them the same that we love the couple that come in who are sleeping together, but they're perfectly heterosexual. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? All embracing love is something that we've not embraced as a church many times because, you know, it's very easy to not love the Christian that calls you a cult. Yeah, it was easy to, to not walk in love to the people that used to, you know, that would say horrible things about the church when I was at college. And it was easy to call them just religious deadheads. That's not love. That's not all embracing love. All embracing love, it gathers everybody. All embracing love, though, probably to the nth, to the, to the hardest degree, goes to the first prayer of the New Testament. You know what the first prayer of the New Testament is? The prayer for your enemies. Pray for those. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who use you. That's all embracing love. When you love the person that wronged you and will never admit it, will never say sorry. And it's easy to, you know, theoretically say, I would love Hitler. And then, and, and, you know, and then someone takes your stapler. <laughs> and I saw, you yeah. in fact, the other day, um, Andrew and I were talking. And um, I was just confessing my sins to him. I said, Scott, I'm so glad to hear you say this. I said, why? He said, well, some years ago, I heard you speak quite strongly, you know, about some 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 things and I thought I'm never going to confess my sin to you <laughs> we, 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 we should be all embracing right now I'm doing the thing that every preacher tells you you shouldn't do which is tell people your sin but Jesus showed the disciples his wounds Paul never could forget the fact that he'd persecuted the church we, we, we are meant to love one another and be all embracing, warts and all, as the phrase goes. And you know, when we actually begin to show our warts, people begin to actually, we begin to just let our hair down a little bit. You know, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect and I recognize it, but you know what, you're not perfect either. Why don't we go now and get off our high horses and love this person over there that we really are struggling to get on with? And you know what, listen, listen I, 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 can, I just, can we all really reflect on ourselves right now that we might, we might say, well, I'm not like that, but you know the little things that you do? I tell you, the thing that I'm wrestling with right now is I, I am struggling to not criticize other churches. I'm getting victory, thank Jesus. It's too easy, though, to walk into a church and immediately go, oh, that's off. Not you, Joel, not you. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you walk in somewhere and you're like, oh, that's, wouldn't do that. Oh, we're a bit better than that. Oh, the usher didn't, didn't smile. You know. And you begin to, it's interesting, the Welsh outpouring that's going on right now, the founding pastor's called Richard Taylor, and he was in Toronto in January, and God put such conviction on him, the way that he was criticizing other ministries. No, re, no, no wonder then that now the Welsh outpouring has come. Do you think it could have come to someone who would have criticized other ministries? I'm coming, I've got a new motto for my life, which is just no prejudice against anybody. That's difficult when, you know, you're in the queue and... There's one checkout person and the queue is long and there's someone else over there stacking shelves and you're thinking, please, would you just open another till, please? And when they finally do and you finally get to them, to love them and go, you know what? It's fine. And to not stand there just going, like, like Muttley. It's an all-embracing love. And we'll find that actually our little thoughts on a day-to-day -day basis betray that more than the big things. Love God. Loving God means loving people. The second, the third thing that this golden circle is, it's a full circle. It's an all-embracing circle. It's a complete circle. As in, as the song goes, you know, all you need is love. Well, it's, all you need isn't love. You, you need to add stuff to it. The Bible's quite clear about it. But love is the primary thing to which everything else is added. Jesus says this, he says, love God, love people, on this hang the law and the prophets. The scribe replies to him and says, you've said it rightly, teacher, that to love God and to love your neighbor is better than all the offerings and sacrifices. That's what he says. In other words, he recognized that their entire religious life, everything they did that they believed was very important, there were something like, you know, was it 3,000, 5, 10,000 laws that they abided by, lots of laws. 4,000 years of their Jewish history, all the richness, all the rituals that they went through, their, the tabernacle, the temple, everything. She's looking right at me, sweetheart. My little girl, sorry. Sorry, that just melts your heart as a dad. Everything, he's saying, everything that they did was all, the, all of it added together combined was not as good as loving God and loving someone. Now, that is a pretty big thing. He's saying, he's saying to us that everything in here hangs on whether we love or not. Everything hangs on whether we love or not. You may sing very much. You may dance. You may pray. You might know the word backwards. You might be, you might be the loudest person Screaming, praise God at the back of the room. You might have tears. You might have a massive library. You, 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 might, you might do all wonderful works of religion. You might do all of those things, but if you don't love, you might give your life as a martyr to be burned. That's pretty big stuff. You might be able to move mountains, baby. You might be able to fathom all mysteries. In other words, if we go to you, you know all scripture and you know what it all means. You might be able to even, God bless you, understand revelation. But if you don't love, it's, it's zip, it's squat, it means nothing. Jesus says this, he's, he says to one church in, in the book of Revelation, he says, I do not find your works pleasing to God. In other words, all of my religious activity is unpleasing to him unless I love. My word, that hits me. It slaps me because, you know, I believe that everything else was wonderful and good and important and that I, I was loving by doing this. But he's saying love is your motivation. It drives you. It thrusts you forward. Everything else hangs on love. And I began to look at myself as a pastor in the mirror and I thought, oh my word, I'm a bad pastor. 
I'm a bad pastor. Don't try to tell me different. I am. I'm a bad pastor. I'm, 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 I'm a recovering pastor, shall we say now. I'm a recovering pastor. It's very good if you don't lie to me. But if you don't love me, then your lack of lies will not make up for your lack of love. I need you to love me. The lights are wonderful. Man, I sweat blood over the the screens and it all being perfect and it's all absolutely wonderful. But I tell you, take all of this away. The service is the same. And I tell you one thing thing for sure, those lights won't get off their hooks and come down and fast for you. You might preach well, you might pray well, but will will you come and visit me when I'm unwell? I need love. The sermon's wonderful, but are you knocking on my door when you know I'm in crisis? Can you preach me to tithe? Yes, but can you reach me when it's tight? It's great that you teach me to give, but when I got nothing, will you come and give me and not say, well, are you tithing? I don't, right now, I need love. My word. What have I been doing? <laughs> what have I been doing? I was too busy helping people to help people. <laughs> I was so busy getting all these little things right, all the, the, the little hooks. Little hookies. That I forgot the very thing the hooks were made for. I, I was so busy helping people that I wasn't actually, and I was too busy to help people. When, 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 you, can't, when you can't actually ditch all of this stuff and put this to one side and make time to go and actually love someone, Yeah, I'm a recovering pastor. Maybe you're a recovering something or another too. Love, as we know, is patient and kind, does not envy, does not both. It is not proud, it is not self-seeking. It does not hold a record of wrongs. Love never fails. None of those things come into play when you're designing a graphic. The graphic's good, but you don't do any of those things out of love. Can I share uh, an insight with you you can preach and not love you can preach well and not love you can preach well and not be praying you can preach well not be praying not be loving sinning before you go up on the platform and still preach well because you know what there are communicators out there who can talk well you can pray out loud well and pray in pray publicly terribly you can, sorry pray private, privately terribly you can pray out loud and you can hear everything and I could do all of this stuff, but privately, was I loving? Was I loving? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to think <laughs> that I was a pastor. I wasn't shepherding the sheep. It says the shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. The shepherd is amongst the sheep, smells of the sheep, knows the sheep. The shepherd's not too busy for the sheep. The shepherd's there for the sheep. The shepherd doesn't think that if I'm constructing some, you know, super thing over here that the sheep can look at, that that's serving the sheep. No, feeding the sheep. <laughs> that's, that's loving them, right? Tending. I didn't see no sheep going, you know, the, you know, the food's all right, but where are the lights? <laughs> the... Golden circle, love, is a visible circle. This circle should be visible. Jesus says, by this will men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. In other words, it was visible. I could look at the disciples and I could tell they loved each other. How could I tell they loved each other? By the way they talked to each other. By the way they served each other. By the way they went out of their way for each other. By the way that they loved them like they loved themselves. By the way, they love them like they loved God. Oh, hang on a second. Doesn't it say, if you don't love your brother who you can see, how can you love God who you can't see? Love's visible. I'm so tired of us being consumed with the invisible love. I'm praying for you. Yeah, right. You're sleeping for me. <laughs> yeah, good one. Thanks. It's true. What, what is that about? 
pray, if you love me and I'm sick, you're not going to pray for me in your little prayer den. You're going to fast. You're going to come and find me. You're going to kneel down with me. You're going to get by my bed. You're going to get on your knees. You're going to get out the oil and you're going to pray. That's what the pastor should do. That's what the brothers and sisters should do for each other. It means that if, if, if you've got nothing, you should come and bring me the stuff that you need. I'll bring it to you. James says, listen, true religion is this. Visiting the orphan and the widow. I don't see anything in there about all the things that we think true religion is. He says, if you say to your brother, you know what? You don't have a coat, but you know, God bless you. Keep on trusting brother in faith and God will bring you the coat. And then you don't give him the coat. Your faith of that works is dead. So love is visible. Jesus says this. He says, when was I sick? When was I poor? When was I thirsty? When was I hungry? He's looking for visible love. You fed me. You gave me water. You gave me clothes. You came and visited me. That's love. Visible love. Tangible love. And I, I, I've, I've not loved visibly. And I, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I want to repent. I've not loved. I'm not loved. How, how, how many of you here that when you were sick, I was there visiting you? How many of you here when you were poor and you had no money that I was there with you? How many of you here was I crying with you? Few, maybe none. Thanks, Nigel, for the break, break the ice there. It's helpful. You know what I mean? It says in Timothy, it says that, you know, your leaders, you want them to be people that are hospitable. It says in Titus that they should be hospitable even to strangers. In other words, when someone arrives at the church and they need some shelter for the night, you don't pawn them off to someone else. The pastor's meant to be the first person who says, hey, come around my house. Never, never did it. Never did it. I've, I've not had visible love. The last thing that love is, the golden circle of love is, it's an inconvenient love. I want to bring you a message today from the word. Love is inconvenient. I want to tell you that if you've got convenient love, it's probably not love. I mean, that's a little bit extreme, but you, you get what I'm driving at. If your love is convenient, then, well, that, that's easy, isn't it? In 1 John, he writes and he says, it's easy for you to have someone come and you say, hey, all's going to be well, don't worry about it. And Jesus says it too. And then, but when, 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 when they're just, you know, they're friends, because even the, the tax collectors, he says, do that. But when an enemy comes to you, when an inconvenience comes to you, will you love? Recently, and I brag about it, but it's nothing to brag on because it's the first thing I've had to brag on for years. So you, you know it's bad by the fact that I have to brag on it. Is a woman came to our church um, some weeks ago called Sue. I never met Sue before in my life. She sat at the back of the row. I'm preaching. I'm talking about Fowder Brennan because I was about to go off to Fowder Brennan for a prayer retreat, which was great, by the way. <laughs> and so after service, she comes and says, hi, our name's Sue. I was at Fowder Brennan about a month ago, and God told me to move to Plymouth, so here I am. And then God said to me on Friday, you need to go to the river. And so I, I realized there's a church called the river, so here I am. And you just spoke about Fowder Brennan, which is where you're going, which I've just come from. So I'm, I think, I'm, you know, this is my church, isn't it? You're my pastor. I was like, hi, okay, nice to meet you. Tuesday, she came to the Bible study. She's loving it, chilling it. I, I, I've met this woman twice, all right? Twice in my life. Sunday morning, I get the text message. She's broken her leg. She's in hospital. She knows no one except me. At that point, we were about to have a party for someone in the church. We'd been in the church for a long time. They were a single mum. We were giving them their first birthday party in years. So that was, also, that was a good thing, but that, that was Faith's idea, not mine. And so we're doing this birthday party and... And I get this text before church, and I think, do I stick around at the birthday party so everyone can see me holding the birthday party for this girl? Or do I do the inconvenient thing and go and help this lady with this broken leg who knows absolutely nobody? And that's not even a big thing. The fact that I have to brag about it is pathetic. But off I went, helped her up the stairs with two other guys who I roped into doing it. She's got this broken leg. I mean, she doesn't even know what. She broke her leg that morning, and there we are helping her up the stairs. And we went, we bought her a bunch of groceries and looked after her, and now we're kind of taking care of the church. But... I did it 
And I felt like it was a divine test from heaven to find out, am I going to practice what I preach? Am I going to practice this reformation that's going on in me? But oh my word, it's the first time I've done something like that. And I should have been doing something like that all the time. That was the very thing I was meant to be paid to do. It was the very thing the Bible says I was meant to do. But I wasn't doing it. Love is inconvenient. Love is inconvenient. Love is patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast. Those are inconvenient things because impatience is very convenient. Envying is very convenient because it's what we naturally do. Love is inconvenient. Jesus says, when he did it not to the least of these. We should be loving each other and loving the least. We should be loving the people at our workplace rather than just trying to pass the hours by before we can get away from them. We should be loving our unlovable boss and praying for them and genuinely loving them rather than criticizing them and complaining about them and just praying God that he would deliver us from them. One Peter says, if you, if you suffer for righteousness, that's good. Slaves, they couldn't pick their masters and we now have such this sense of we've got all these rights that we, we endure very little. And you find out if you really love when you begin to endure some. Will, will, will I love? Will I allow people to speak into my life when it hurts? Will I open myself up? and uh, will, will I, That's inconvenient, but will I love? Will I, will I go out of my way to help people who are in need? Will I love? Will, will, I, will, I, will I break out of my fear enough that when the person at the checkout gives me the groceries, that I love them to say, Jesus loves you? That's inconvenient, love. I would reckon that most of us don't do it. Every, every day now, I'm pressured to do it, and I still haven't done it. I'm telling you, I, I, I stand before you weak and un, unaccomplished. But we should. Just because I'm not doing it doesn't mean that I, shouldn't, that I should not say the fact that we should do it. That's love. Love means that you love means that you don't it, you don't blank the homeless person when you walk past them. I mean, what is up with that? That we will walk past someone who's who's lying on the streets. I don't listen. They they might well be looking for the next fix. Go and buy them some food or something. You're not that busy. What is it? Two pounds to buy them a sandwich? But we we walk past. We cross the road, and then switch back once we pass them. What's up with that? It's inconvenient, but we should love the least of these. What about the person that wronged us? Do we, we love them? Oh, my word, I mean. Love is inconvenient. Love's very inconvenient. But it's what we've been called to, brothers and sisters. It's what we're called to. We're so caught up with preaching lifestyle. You can have this. You can be this. We even talk about our callings. How, yeah, you know, God's going to give you all that you've been longing for. And we, we, we've got this kind of cut career, celebrity status in church. And we, we all are oh, the blessings. Yeah. We're called to love. Love endures long. Love never fails. I, I, I want to share something with me that I can't help but pray about every day. And this morning it rose up in me. There are people who aren't here today, who've, who've, you know, over the last couple of weeks or months are not here. My heart breaks not seeing them here. It hurts me. It, re it hurts. It really hurts. And love says, I love you so much that I'm going to pray for you. That even if you will not hear me and you refuse to talk to me, and I pray that, I pray that we would because we're meant to leave our gift at the altar and go and make up with a person that we know has something wrong with us. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you left your gift at the altar? Hey, me too, right? When was the last time I left my gift at the altar and went and found the person I knew was upset at me? Normally what we do is if they're upset, they can say it. Let them be bold. Let them, let them get some confidence. What? Yeah. But I, I hate the fact that there are people not here. And I, I tell you, love goes, you know, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to fast for you. You will never see it, but I don't care. That's love. 
Charles Wesley said this. This is for you, Don. Love can bow down the stubborn neck, the stone to flesh convert, soften and melt and pierce and break an adamantine heart. I love it when he says the greatest of these is love. Love is the message of the gospel. God so loved the world. Love is why we are gathered here today. Love is what we should be full of towards each other. Love says that I don't understand, I don't agree, but I'm going to persevere because I love. That's love. Love to you today, if you do not know Jesus, oh my word, it's the most wonderful thing. Is the love that we should have, he does have. He loves you without failing. He loves you without ceasing. It says, if we are unfaithful, yet he remains faithful. He loves you. Oh my word, his heart burns for you. And he will continue to love you. He is long suffering. He is our image of love. Oh, thank God for God and the love with which he loved us. We seek him. And today, all of you, 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 you got a promise to know that the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts. You got a promise that says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, my word. I want to tell you today, if, if, if you do not know him, today is the best day of your life. Because this love that we should have, he does have. He has an enduring love. It's a circle because it's never ending. Then what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall principalities and powers, angels and demons, trials and tribulations, things to come and things that are, shall they? Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing will ever separate you from him. Oh my word, his love. And that is the love that we should have today. Oh, Jesus. We hunger for your love, huh? I want to I wanna ask you to forgive me for being a bad pastor. I'm not talking about anyone else. I'm talking about me. I'm not today insinuating. You know, I'm not insinuating a thing. I'm talking about me. I love you. I pray that in Plymouth... Which is better than Exeter, you know. We, we, uh, I, pray that we, I pray that we get all types of people and that we love them. I pray that we're a church that never has unspoken things, never has didn't us and quarrelsome and divisions because we are just, we are in love with each other and with God. My prayer for three months has been for you guys. Bind us together in love. I pray that we'd be bound together in love. And today I urge every one of us to love. We all must take this and work it out. No one here has got this perfected and complete. Let us work this out. Let us love each other. Let us love God. Let us love people. Let everything else hang on that. Should we stand? We have a big picture as a church. You're thinking, what's the vision? The vision is go into all the world and preach the gospel. And make disciples of all the nations. There we go. It's already in the Bible. No need for a fresh one. And we, this is, this is our vision as believers. And we all love the big picture. But you know what the big picture is made up of? Lots of tiny pictures. You're right, Nigel. That's it. Lots of small pictures. And there are so many cool churches out there that we want to emulate and we want to be like because you want their fruit. Sure you do. You, you, you want to reach what they're reaching. But you forget that their big picture is made up of lots of small pictures. And never must we be too focused on the big picture that we forget about the small picture. If you have, if you have no small picture, you will never have big picture. You, you just got hot air. Let us all pursue the little picture. Every day asking yourself, I'm pursuing the little picture. I'm pursuing the little acts of love, the real love, the inconvenient love, the all-embracing love, the completeness of love, the fullness of love. I'm seeking that every day. Make it your prayer when you wake up. Say, God, today fill me with your love and may, may I exude love. 
I, I, I want you to go home. I'm doing it every day. I'm searching my heart. I want you to go home and write down a list of people you've got to make right with. Write down a list of where you have not been loving. Write down a list of the things that you have not forgiven. Find those that you know have something against you. Let's sort it out. Let's get it right. Else we will, we will never reach others if we can't love each other. Amen. Amen. Let's hold hands across this room. Can we sing, I love you, Jesus, I will always love you now and forever, I belong for you? And when you're singing it, when you're building it out, loving him means what? Loving people. If you sing, I love you, Jesus, I always love you, now and forever I belong to you, then you cannot sing that and, not, and it not mean, I love you. I will always love you. I belong to you. We're one. Maybe you can even look someone in the eye today and say, I love you. Maybe you can actually look someone and say, I belong to you. My love to you, I, I, I desire that it will never fail. If you're sick, I'm there, I'm praying. If you're needy, I'm there. If you're rejoicing, I'm rejoicing. If you're crying, I'm crying with you. If you're celebrating, I will celebrate with you. I, I will not be envy. I will not be impatient. I will be kind. Can we sing it? I love you, Jesus. I'll always love you now and forever. I belong to you. I love you. I hold on to nothing but love if we are his we cannot hold on to any unforgiveness bitterness envy strife frustration anger hatred malice we are his this is the gospel this is the gospel this is the bread and butter of the gospel so let's pray for our church father we lift up our church we lift up each other every hand that holds another hand we pray for those people as if we were praying for our own flesh and blood so they may not be a flesh and blood of our natural yet they are our spiritual brothers and sisters we are part of that family in the which the whole of heaven and earth is named and father we pray that you would bind us together with cords of love that are tight i pray that you would clad us closely knit us closely together i pray that no one would be lost I pray no hatred would flourish. I pray no fear would be present. Oh, we pray that we would love one another. We pray that the hallmark of the river would be love. It might have been faith. It might have been power. It might have been excellence. It might have been a whole bunch of things. But I pray that it would be love. 
that the overwhelming hallmark would be an over would be a, an all encompassing all consuming all stretching love father we pray that you change us change us father oh we commit to love today we commit ourselves to love today we say we will love you we will love people from this day forth we we determine to walk in love